Hello, welcome to Pathagonia. This is Jay. Today we are going to talk about esophagus tumors using Kurtz notes. Before we begin, if you already haven't been to Dr. Shabberg's website, I would highly, highly recommend it. It's got his famous Kurtz notes, which have been invaluable for medical students, more particularly pathology residents and staff. He's got quizzes, as well as a, if you want to learn about Dr. Shabberg, he's got an About Me page as well. So without further ado, let's talk about esophagus tumors. First off, histology. So here is where you would eat food and it would go down the esophagus into the stomach. And it, the esophagus is lined by non-keratinizing stratified squamous mucosa. Below that, you have your muscularis mucosae. And I'd like to talk about this as an example of how knowing histology is very important in differentiating different treatment implications. What I mean by this is in the esophagus, your muscularis mucosae can be reduplicated. And if you have esophageal adenocarcinoma that goes past the first layer of the muscularis mucosae, you may be tempted to call it adenocarcinoma invading through the submucosa, which changes the staging of the tumor. However, if you see closely in that there is another air, a layer of muscularis mucosae, this reduplication, then technically it is still intramucosal carcinoma, which lowers the staging. You have esophageal ducts, and you have your submucosal glands. I tend to forget the esophagus also have submucosal glands as well, but it makes sense that you need some lubrication for the food to go down into your stomach. And then below your submucosa, and often not seen on biopsies, you have your muscularis propria, and distally towards the stomach, you have your smooth muscle, and proximally towards your mouth, you have your skeletal muscle. Benign incidental findings that your endoscopist may give you on biopsies include pancreatic heterotopia, metaplasia, multilayered epithelium, which is epithelium at the transition between squamous and glandular mucosa with some features of both. And it kind of looks like squamous metaplasia of the cervix. Inlet patch is stomach epithelium in the upper esophagus. And I remember a case where the endoscopist said that they sampled esophagus and I look at it and it looks like stomach. And in hindsight and after feedback from my staff, it was an inlet patch. Clangular lesions, you have intestinal metaplasia, complete and incomplete type. Now incomplete type has a higher risk for dysplasia and that in turn has a higher risk of carcinoma. Before we talk about incomplete intestinal metaplasia, complete intestinal metaplasia is the exact duplicate of intestinal mucosa with absorptive cells between your goblet cells. So here's your goblet cell and your absorptive cells, and it's usually seen in stomach. Um, if you see complete intestinal metaplasia, a differential you want to have in the back of your mind is AMAG or autoimmune metaplastic atrophic gastritis. That increases your risk for pernicious anemia as well as neuro endocrine neoplasm. Now incomplete intestinal metaplasia, you'll have goblet cells as you can see here with intervening foveolar cells and it's more common at the gastroesophageal junction and has a higher risk for dysplasia. One of my staff told me that he looks for incomplete intestinal metaplasia when there's a background of a lot of complete intestinal metaplasia and if there isn't a background of complete intestinal metaplasia, he has a high threshold to call it incomplete intestinal metaplasia. When we talk about Barrett's esophagus, it's important to know that there is a little bit of nuance as to the definition based on the country. For UK and Japan, Barrett's esophagus is defined as columnar epithelium regardless of the presence of goblet cells extending greater than or equal to one centimeter above the gastric folds. The AGA 2011 says Barrett's esophagus is when you have columnar epithelium with goblet cells in the esophagus and no length is required. And the ACG 2016 said Barrett's esophagus is, is columnar epithelium with goblet cells extending greater than or equal to one centimeter above the gastric fold. And it's important to know this, for instance, if you read a research paper about Barrett's esophagus and adenocarcinoma of the esophagus, and it's from a British or Japanese paper, they'll have a different definition as to who they classified as having Barrett's esophagus. Risk factors for intestinal metaplasia include GERD, obesity, male gender, smoking, H. pylori. And Dr. Shapra provides a succinct but very informative explanation of how intestinal metaplasia can ultimately lead to cancer. Acid bile reflux is the insult in the uh, stomach esophageal environment that'll lead to intestinal metaplasia and that can lead to mutations which can thereby lead into low-grade dysplasia. 
if you get a TP53 mutation, that will lead to high-grade dysplasia, and that can lead to further DNA chromosomal instability, and that can lead to cancer. Now, I want to highlight TP53 mutation because that can be helpful in assessing whether there is dysplasia in the esophagus, and we will talk about that shortly. Now, before we talk about dysplasia, two things. One is when I look at intestinal metaplasia, my reflex question is, is there dysplasia? And you have four answers. You have it's negative for dysplasia, indefinite for dysplasia, low-grade dysplasia, and high-grade dysplasia. The second thing I'd like to emphasize is, from my experience and from what my staff said, interpreting dysplasia in the esophagus can be very difficult. And so if you have trouble doing this too, know that you are not alone. But there are some tips that can help us. There is this, the four lines, which helps us to determine if there is preserved cell polarity. If there aren't four lines easily identifiable, then in the back of your mind, you want to think about the presence of dysplasia. Now, what are these four lines? You have your apical mucin, your base of the mucin cap, cytoplasm between the mucin and the nuclei, and your fourth line is the row of nuclei. So there is maintained nuclear polarity. Another sign you want to look for is surface maturation. If you do a P53 staining, it'll be wild type, or I will emphasize the pattern of P53 because it's so important to know across different organ systems. So wild type is kind of patchy staining. If there's mutated P53 staining, include null, where you have no staining at all, overexpressed, and lastly, cytoplasmic because P53 is a nuclear stain. Okay, going back. The management for negative for dysplasia, but in a background of intestinal metaplasia, is follow up in three to five years. Indefinite for dysplasia. This is used in cases where it is unclear if there is true dysplasia. Some contexts that can lead to this diagnosis include like inflammation or partial maturation. You could consider getting a P53 stain. And the management is you treat for reflux, hoping things calm down and it clears so you can better see whether changes are due to in inflammation or actual true dysplasia and repeat biopsy in three to six months. Low-grade dysplasia, this is adenoma-like and truly dysplastic appearing in typical intestinal type. We'll talk about different other types of dysplasia, but you'll have this pencilate hyperchromatic nuclei in your intestinal type, kind of like a tubular adenoma. Um, it extends to the surface epithelium, and there's often an abrupt transition from reactive to neoplastic. It's important to know abrupt transition in dysplasia. And you'll have that loss of the four lines, but retained basal nuclei, as you can see here. You'll have hyperchromaticity, and the management is mucosal ablation. High-grade dysplasia, you'll have nuclear hyperchromasia and pleomorphism. You'll have loss of cell and nuclear pleomorphism. For instance, you don't know if this is the basal layer or if this is the basal layer, if not for the context of the lamina propria. There's no surface maturation. There's rounded irregular nuclei, and there's pleomorphism compared to this cell side. Um, there's complex architecture, and the management is mucosal ablation if flat, and an endoscopic mucosal resection or an EMR if there's mucosal irregularity in order to rule out carcinoma. And then this is an instance of P53 IHC. It's considered indicative of dysplasia and neoplasia, neoplasia if it's overexpressed, where every nucleus is strong, or null fun phenotype, where the tumor cells are all negative. Other types of glandular dysplasia other than intestinal, as we saw here, include foveolar type, where you'll have few, if any, goblet cells, and it may arise independently, prominent cytoplasmic mucin, hyperchromatic slightly enlarged nuclei, and possible pseudostratification, and that's your foveolar type dysplasia. You also have your basal crypt dysplasia, where you have dysplasia at the base of the crypt, that matures at the surface, which is extremely hard in my opinion, and small cell pattern, where you have proliferation of numerous tiny monotonous glands with loss of polarity and nuclear hyperchromasia. And then from that, dysplasia, from that intestinal metaplasia to dysplasia to adenocarcinoma, let's talk about adenocarcinoma, where this is invasion across the basement membranes and nearly all occur near the gastroesophageal junction due to that Barrett's esophagus and often present with dysphagia. 
The lamina appropria is, uh, is overrun by glands, and you may see single infiltrating cells or expansively growing glands without intervening lamina appropria. Features associated with early invasion include luminal necrosis, prominent nucleoli, glands growing parallel to the surface. Now, features associated with deep invasion include angulated glands, prominent desmoplasia, at least into submucosa likely, because only when the cancer invades into the submucosa, you have that desmoplastic response. This is seen in esophageal tumors, but also um, in other GI tumors like their colorectal carcinomas that invade into the submucosa, you have this prominent stromal res desmoplastic response, but not if it's intramucosal. Again, uh, features associated with deep invasion, just going back, pagetoid spread of malignant cells in squamous epithelium. Now this is what I was alluding to earlier when you have reduplication of the muscularis mucosae. You want to take that into consideration if you call it esophageal adenocarcinoma that invades into the submucosa. But these histologic clues can help you assess whether it does invade into the submucosa. And classification, uh, it shows a mixed gastric intestinal lineage. And there are multiple patterns of growth in the, including the most common is tubular, as you can see here. You can also have papillary, mucinous, and signet ring cell patterns, which has worse prognosis. And often a mixture of patterns is seen. There are staging challenges. Often, as I mentioned earlier, in Barrett's esophagus, the muscularis mucosae can be duplicated and or distorted, which can make determining determining the death of invasion challenging, particularly on endoscopic mucosal resection. In terms of therapeutic impl Im uh, implications, you want to consider getting HER2 testing because if it's amplified, then the patient is approved for treatment with trastuzumab. And first, you start with an IHC of HER2, and if it's equivocal, meaning it's 2 plus, not 3 plus, then you do FISH for amplification assessment. Management, if it's low stage clinically, just intramucosal, you'll do an endoscopic mucosal resection and ablation. However, if it's advanced stage into the submucosa or more, then you want to do an esophagectomy, if not too advanced, and then possibly after chemo and radiation. It may be hard to distinguish adenocarcinoma of the esophagus from squamous cell carcinoma of the esophagus requiring stains. Undifferentiated carcinoma should be considered if the IHC patterns are equivocal or there are no definite morphologic features favoring one or for the other. So adenocarcinoma will be CK7 positive, P63, P40, CK56 negative, whereas P63, P40, CK56 will be positive in squamous cell carcinoma. Um, adenocarcinoma will also have PAS slash mucin stain being positive, whereas it's negative in squamous cell carcinoma. Here is a reference for how to perform HER2 testing and when to reflex to fish and what defines 1 plus, 2 plus, and 3 plus. Lastly, squamous lesions, squamous papilloma. This is a papillary proliferation of squamous epithelium with fibrovascular core, as you can see, of lamina propria. It's benign, may contain coilocytes, but more dysplasia is rare usually exophytic, but can be flat or endophytic. And it results from mucosal irritation, stimulating a hyper-regenerative response. And irritants include HPV, GERD, trauma, squamous dysplasia. You'll have cytologic atypia, including nuclear enlargement, pleomorphism, hyperchromasia, loss of polarity, and nuclear overlap. And you'll have architectural atypia, as well with abnormal maturation. You can have low-grade dysplasia and high-grade dysplasia, um, kind of similar to dysplasia in the context of esophageal adenocarcinoma precursors. Uh, low-grade dysplasia, uh, squamous dysplasia, is involvement of the lower half of the epithelium only with mild atypia, and high-grade dysplasia is involvement of more than one half of the epithelium or severe cytologic atypia. Squamous cell carcinoma, is a malignant epithelial neoplasm showing squamous differentiation with keratinocyte type cells with intercellular bridges and or keratinization. 
Risk factors include tobacco, alcohol, very hot beverages, achalasia, caustic ingestion, and most prevalent in Asia. HPV is thought to not contribute significantly. Although it is present in many cases, it is not integrated nor transcriptionally active. Often presents with dysphagia, and genetics is a complex cytogenetics but with frequent TP53 mutations. Subtypes include verrucous, which is often in the setting of chronic irritation. It's exceedingly well differentiated with minimal atypia. It's a papillary surface, broad pushing invasion with associated inflammation. There's a spindle cell subtype where you'll have this polypoid growth with high grade spindle cell component and a basaloid, which is a solid or nested growth of basaloid cells. There's no HPV association, unlike your basaloid squamous cell carcinoma in the oral pharynx. Well, thank you so much for tuning in. Just our quick recap, we talked about esophagus tumors, histology, how the muscularis mucosae can be reduplicated. We talked about inlet patch, multilayered epithelium, pancreatic heterotopia, metaplasia. Glandular lesions, there's complete and incomplete. Incomplete, look for it in a setting of a lot of complete intestinal metaplasia. Incomplete has higher risk for dysplasia. We talked about different criteria for Barrett's esophagus depending on your country. And there's a, there's a risk factor for intestinal metaplasia becoming low-grade dysplasia with your TP53, becoming high-grade dysplasia, and becoming cancer of adenocarcinoma of the esophagus. When you think of intestinal metaplasia, think, is it negative for dysplasia, indefinite for dysplasia, low-grade dysplasia, or high-grade dysplasia? And use your four-line tool to help you assess whether there is dysplasia. Indefinite for dysplasia, that may happen when there is a lot of inflammation. Low-grade dysplasia, you can have your adenoma-like in typical intestinal type dysplasia. I say intestinal type because there is um, other types of glandular dysplasia in the esophagus, including foveolar type, basal crypt dysplasia, small cell pattern. There's high-grade dysplasia, and if you're unsure, you can get your P53 to help you out. Adenocarcinoma, Remember that there can be signs, histologic clues that it's early invasion or deep invasion. Early invasion, glands growing parallel to the surface, luminal necrosis, deep invasion, angulated glands, prominent desmoplasia, and pagetoid spread of malignant cells in squamous epithelium. And HER2 is helpful because it has treatment implications. If you're unsure on IHC in terms of if it's equivocal, like 2 plus, then do your FISH. Lastly, squamous lesions, a benign lesion and squamous papilloma. We talked about squamous dysplasia. You can have low grade involvement of the lower half or high grade involvement greater than one half or severe cytologic atypia. And then lastly, we talked about squamous cell carcinoma of the esophagus, which demographically is more prevalent in Asia. You should see intercellular bridges and or keratinization and subtypes include verrucous, spindle cell and basaloid. Thank you so much for your support for Pathagonia. Thank you to Dr. Schaberg, and we hope to see you next time.